Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, and this is your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we're going to be diving into everything from finance to Columbia, Washington's lesson learned over the last five years, and everything in between. On the line with us is Dan of Good CBD Products. So Indo Expo is coming up in Portland in about a month. When I was at Indo Expo in Denver last year, I ran into a couple of guys from Mexico City, and they were salivating over the idea of oil coming out of Colombia. Apparently, Colombia has been processing really good oil for really low prices uh, of concentrate for cannabis medically. And so the really low labor has people from Mexico City uh, intrigued about those business opportunities. And so I started kind of focusing over the last year and a half on Columbia. I'm going to have um, some people from Clever Leaf on the podcast in August to talk about concentrates. And so there's an article from Yahoo Finance that a lot of Colombians are switching from coffee to cannabis as legalization moves forward and opportunities advance. But you know, it makes sense, right? In the end, if you have a, a globe and a global economy, the fact of the matter is you start you know, rifling around and seeing where you can find your low labor costs and all of that. I, uh, I actually do a lot of offshoring myself. So, you know, I, I get it. it. Makes sense. If you can find quality production someplace where there's a lower cost of living and save some money and make some money. Sounds kind of cheesy, but I got my international business degree after I, the internet came out in the mid nineties. And I just knew that business was going to be worldwide. <clears throat> You're going to operate worldwide and boundaries and cities and country borders weren't going to matter. And in Colombia, it's looking the same way and all driven by profit, right? So the potential margin is nearly 2 billion. That's twice as much as both the fruits and flowers, um, including coffee, which is the second largest in Colombia, providing uh, 500,000 jobs for growers, 95% of which are small family farms and the largest source of rural employment and the uh, director of... In a lot of ways, it is the rising tide raising all boats, right? So, gosh, I found a, a better price on this commodity. Whatever the commodity is, I can afford, you know, to, to do less and make more. Jeez, I think I'll go grow this one, right? So I've got, actually, I've got like an art and a biz team in Colombia, right? I've got some data miners in Bangladesh that I work with. I got some farm and crew in Jamaica, blah, blah. It's a funny planet. You know, these days, you know, you get up in the middle of the night and you communicate with your homie that's over there on the other continent. Right. And Colombia is setting themselves up to be a big box store for concentrate. Um, and moving over to a Benzinga article, the former Home Depot CEO joins a cannabis company as a strategic advisor. Just the news alone increased this company's stock by 7.7% knowing that their uh, strategic advisor is a big box store that can help scale up and, and go international. Sure, sure. It's again, when one of the things that the podcast continues to reveal is, you know, one of the next big opportunities is distribution, right? And, and especially, you know, that whole thing of, well, if it does go global, and it sure the trend lines would indicate, then, again, there there are some you know, massive strategic plays, you know, that are, you can bet on more than a few whiteboards, right? Absolutely. And some of those companies are going to be uh, legit and stay around and some of them are going to go bankrupt. And there's a title that if you invest in cannabis, be ready to dodge bombshells. <laughs> And that can be seen in Canatrust Holdings that received a compliance report from Health Canada notifying the company that its greenhouse facility in Ontario is non-compliant with certain regulations. <laughs> and so this Yahoo Finance article goes into saying that the company said it has accepted Health Canada's non-compliance finding has taken actions to ensure current and future compliance. It sounds very similar to a company that I was working with up in Canada to automate their joint rolling systems, uh, Ace and Industries. Uh, they ended up losing their license and probably going through several lawsuits right now. I uh, I just saw it out in Colorado. I work with a manufacturer. Colorado changed it, changed a rule around manufacturing specifications, essentially tightening them. And the manufacturer threw in the towel. Said, you know what? We can't do that. And literally just walked out of the game. And they have people who've been backing them and, you know, friends and family and all of these different things, you know, we're dodging bombshells, right? We, you wake up in the day and you say to yourself, gosh, what's today going to bring? 
And with that, there's a cannabis stock news daily roundup that shows wellness and CBD brand Kaleidoscope Labs raised $4 million seed round to support their expansion efforts. Um, SOL Global Investments completed a $50 million private placement financing by the way of an issue and sale of a senior secured non-convertible debenture to an arm's length institutional investor. So let's break that down because that's that's a lot to absorb yeah, right there. Yeah, that's a compound sentence. And it's it's fascinating for me because seeing a debenture at this scale, $50 million to be offered non-convertible is fascinating. So what that means is they've been able to sell a, a bond, let's just call it a, a debt vehicle. It's, a, it's essentially a bond, non-convertible, so you can't get equity or, or stock or shares or voting rights. And a debenture is basically a bond that isn't backed by collateral as normal. It's not backed by assets. It's backed by general credit or AKA debt, which is weird. I mean, there's companies like Visa who make their, their entire profits on debt. And so it's, it, it kind of makes sense. But at this level in the game, it's just showing me that there's a lot of speculation um, and this is a blank check company. So their net proceeds is, is working capital and general corporate purposes, which is basically a, a blank check company. And to build out additional assets. Uh, and so it's, it's really just general. And so they've got $50 million to play with. Um, and I would be cautious because they're traded over the counter. They have a five digit symbol ending in F. And what that means is they're hmm. not DTC eligible. So the Depository Trust and Clearing Corp allows for any companies that trade uh, digitally, which is all of them, to be able to settle and have uh, compliance and, and regulations. But if your, if your symbol is five digits ending in F, it means that it's probably not DTC eligible. So they're not giving the necessary uh, documents to stay within compliance. So we don't really know what's happening. And then on top of that, if you have a brokerage firm and you want to buy that, it's going to cost you $75 to buy it and $75 to sell it, even if it's trading as a penny stock, because of the extra cost in settling with a paper transaction instead of digitally. And that's the benefit of being a DTC eligible client is giving people like retail investors, you and I, the peace of mind knowing that, okay, these guys are putting in the necessary paperwork, staying within compliance, um, but being a blank check company and probably not being DTC eligible seems shady. Although I do like the idea of the non-convertible debenture just because it, it shows that there is some normalization, but definitely speculation. You know, the concept of, is it a trend or is it an outlier, right? Is it, is it this thing that oh, wow, it's the first domino to fall and here comes a bunch of similar kind of deals? Or is it this thing of like, yeah, yeah, nobody will ever do that again. Sorry, homie. I've seen other debt rounds, so it's it's becoming more of a trend. But this particular part about being a blank check company without specifics, I find fascinating. So it's definitely frothy. You know, what's funny about this this market is as a, you know, as somebody who learns from the podcast, right? I, I am not of your grade with regards to understanding markets and such. I have this automatic assumption that big money is doing its real due diligence, right? I've sold companies for 20 grand. I've sold companies for $2 million. I haven't gone out and raised, you know, 50 or a hundred million. Okay. I'd like to. And at the same time, I'm like, how do these deals keep happening at that level? How is that possible? Uh, in other news, there's slang worldwide that's expanding into Florida. They've also recently expanded into Puerto Rico. And as we've had discussed on previous podcasts, Puerto Rico is probably the best place in the world for companies like slang who have CBD products because Puerto Rico as a U.S. protected territory, the Puerto Rico has American citizens, but they don't have congressional representation. And since you, uh, can't have taxation without representation. Puerto Rico is the only place in the world as an American business that you can not be taxed uh, or pay tax on U.S. income. So slang worldwide has, um, has expanded into Puerto Rico, which is smart. And 
The deal watch, according to MJ Business Daily, uh, capital is continuing to stay ahead of the pace of last year, but it is slowing down. And that's relative because it's, it's already ahead of last year. So there's a hot streak in capital raises that might have chilled slightly in recent weeks, but almost $7.4 billion has been raised through the week ended July 5th. So that compares with $4.5 billion for a comparable period last year. So far in 2019, total raises led by $5.2 billion in equity raises, followed by $2.2 billion through debt raises. And by comparison last year, the breakdown was $3.3 billion and $1.22 billion respectively. So this week's series from the Marijuana Business Daily and Viridian Capital Advisors uh, shows that the top raises closed in the past two weeks were Certera Wellness, that closed a $100 million equity raise, and then Flower One, which trades on the Canadian Stock Exchange, closed a debt financing worth up to $30 million and said the money will be used to expand its Nevada processing facility. And then other top deals that closed in the past two weeks, Canopy Growth had an acquisition of Key Leaf Science, a privately owned Saskatchewan-based bioproduct extraction company. And Ianthus Holdings, which trades on the Canadian Stock Exchange, closed a $10 million purchase of a New Jersey-based CBD for life, which sells wellness products online. Dang, that's quite a jump in one year with regards to investment, Brad. And then, you know, the, the truth of, starting to see the deals move from all paper, right? All equity to, you know, some of them. Right. It's almost doubled. So it's definitely increasing. I mean, billions, that's, that's a lot of money. And we're seeing still Canadian companies increasing their capital acquis or capital raises in Canada and then bringing that capital back to the U S in the form of CBD products and expanding that to take advantage of, of 280E, which is a tax provision that doesn't allow you to write off uh, schedule one narcotics like, marijuana but sure. it does allow you to write off cbd products so they're taking advantage of that and it's it's definitely worth it but you know again to watch the the global machinations of large companies say to themselves how do i position myself in the u.s market while i look at these trend lines see what i think is resolution to the conundrum of you know uh, uh, restricted market space and all of these things and at the same time, until those rules change, they haven't changed. And so finding ways to have people know your brand, to be in market, to start you know, building a customer base. So when the thunderclap hits, you're ready to roll. It's interesting to watch. We've been watching it for five years in Washington State. There's an MJ Business Daily report about the lessons learned from Washington after five years of recreational sales. We've definitely seen some restrictions on investment capital. Um, as well as not being vertically integrated. So producers and processors are separate from retailers. They can't be owned by the same people. Um, we have an overabundance of producers, probably 1,400 farmers, which is just too many. And so all in all, it's kind of made an impact on, on the state for other people to look at and maybe emulate some laws and then avoid some others. But essentially, Washington ruled out the second adult uh, cannabis market followed behind Colorado. And over the last five years, Washington cannabis business owners have persevered through a lot of competition and regulation uh, and just volatility in general. So a study was released by the Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Board in March of 2019 found that the recreational cannabis cultivators are using less than half of their allotted licensed canopy. Didn't you say that Oregon had a, an abundance of cannabis by a billion joints? Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. So Oregon, they did this thing where they let basically everybody who wanted to, you know, jump in and have a production license. And the outcome is so much additional cannabis that it, it's, I mean, again, oversupply, it doesn't actually encompass what has occurred. It is a catastrophic oversupply. Okay. You know, this is the thing. In Oregon, there is so much excess cannabis, they you know, if you ran the numbers, they don't need to grow any more cannabis for six years. For six years. Right. I'm just pulling up some Kush Marketplace pricing, nine cents per gram that we've seen in Washington for uh, frozen blast <laughs> material or four cents a gram for trim, nine cents a gram. Um, and so we've definitely seen Washington cultivators suffering from depressed wholesale flower pricing, but cannabis sales continue to increase. We reported that it was 
third overall uh, at 1.1 billion in expected sales behind Colorado at 1.3 billion and then California at like 3.1 billion. So Washington uh -huh. has the lowest pricing um, and yet the highest sales tax and inferring from the data, that's because the licensing is separate. And so there's an incredible amount of competition since the retailers can't sell their own flour. And so it gives a massive amount of power to the retailers and the producer processors have to really um, cut margins. And it's, it's brutal, which makes places like Puerto Rico even more important if you're a CBD manufacturer to utilize all of the advantages you have, like a 4% corporate tax cap for a place like Puerto Rico. You know, in Washington, the uh, the fact of the matter is, as a consumer, low cost cannabis has been a wonderful thing, okay. And that that price fight and that um, you know that two dollar joint, that dollar joint, that sixty or seventy dollar ounce, okay. And at the same time, if you came into this industry uh, two years ago, five years ago, you did not run a spreadsheet saying what happens when I grow cannabis and it retails for $50 an ounce, okay? And so, you know, I'd like to see balance, I guess, myself as a consumer. I, I like low-cost cannabis, but I'd also like to see the farmer have a quality of life and the, the market be stable. And in the end, everybody's got to make their, make their share. So, you know, Washington, I would say, has blown it. It'll be interesting to watch, you know, a couple of years from now, what's the price of an ounce going to be? Does it continue to trend down or does it somehow magically return to a hundred or $200? I don't think so, but it'll be interesting to watch. I'm expecting the market to sort of bifurcate in, into macro and micro, just like any other industry right now, they're the terpene profiles and, and really the, the aroma is not there. Uh, you don't have the nose on it that some black market, uh, does I, I'm in Seattle and I walk around and, and I think that some homeless people smoke better than I do sometimes. I'm looking at $40 an ounce in a store and that's great for an everyday occasion. But if I want something nice, I don't even feel like sometimes I have that option. I'm going to throw out a TJ's Organics, which probably has some of the best smelling flour consistently out there. Uh, but aside from them, it just kind of seems like everyone else is trying to throw product out without using the, the nose first. And I think that's how we make our decisions is what kind of terpene profile do I want, knowing that you know, your body understands that smelling something that has lemonine is going to make you relax and your body's either going to like that or like a citrusy, uplifting, euphoric, energetic effect. Uh, and being in a plastic bag, not being able to smell it is a detriment. And that's why I believe that there's going to be, a, you know, there'll be a micro environment where some of these growers that are tier two are going to be able to sell product that's $4 a gram wholesale, while other companies go bankrupt because they can't grow for less than $1.50. So there will be uh, two different markets, one for the majority and one for the more discerning customer. I feel for the farmer, again, in the end, I want quality product. I don't want hay. I'm a old black market guy. I come from a time when you used to pay 400 bucks to get an ounce of quality marijuana. And today, I would say that for the most part, you need to move to about 100 bucks an ounce to meet that. But I don't think that $200 an ounce or $300 an ounce that I find in Washington cannabis validates that pricing relative to that $100 ounce. I know that some uh, companies in Oregon are being. Uh, acquired. And so if there's some um, value investors out there looking for some opportunities, Washington State might be the, the one. There's been licensing deals for as low as a dollar in exchange for just uh, you know maybe 6% royalties for farms that just can't make any money. So with that, we're going to roll this one up. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is a Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe or don't. And I'm out.